All right, Bridget, Alex, you guys ready? Yep. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for being with us this morning for the Growth of the Game panel. Um, as kind of advertised, we have Bridget Ackley here with us, junior golf leader at the Park West Palm. Um, and then Alex Fernandez, Director of Instruction at Cranon Golf Academy. Um, unfortunately, John Moscoso was is not able to join us this morning. He had an emergency come up, unfortunately. So um, it'll be the two of them. And then we have Ellen Briner here, um, our Senior Junior Golf Manager um, here at the section. So between the three of them, we're going to go through um, kind of some of the different growth of the game initiatives that we have um, here at the section and for you to implement at your facilities with PGA Junior League, obviously Junior Golf, and then PGA Hope. Um, so please feel free throughout uh, the session if you have any questions that you'd like us to ask our panel here, um, we can do that. Um, and we'll be sure to, to get to those questions. Um, and make sure we open up the discussion at the end as well. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll start with the PGA Junior League. Um, so Bridget, I'll start with you. I mean, with PGA Junior League, obviously it's it's to get started at the park here um, this summer, but, but with your experiences at past facilities, how has the program impacted your facility in the community? Um, Last summer when I was in Michigan, I ran it at the public facility that I was at for the first time. Um, I had 17 players register for this. Individually, I made about $6,000. Um, that's a 350 coaching fee per player. Um, the, the community thought this program was amazing because they've never really had something like more of a team golf experience. So with it being more inclusive for beginner players and some that, you know, want to play more, but don't really want to be too competitive in tournaments. It was, it was a great experience for them. Um, on the operations side, we charged $5 per player during matches. We had four matches. Um, so the facility was making close to $350. And then for parents, we charged a $25 cart fee. So, Let's say um, if all of our parents had a cart for three matches, that's uh, just over $1,200. So between just the small amount there and then with food and beverage after we, we offered a discount to, for everybody to hang out, um, all around it was a win-win. I do know the facility that I was at last summer is continuing to build on the program now. Um, here at the park, we were going to try to host a spring league, but since we weren't officially open and we did not have a official website yet, um, decided to pull the plug. But uh, in the future, we're, we're planning to host a fall, winter, and spring. So we'll, we'll hit it hard here um, over the summer for our marketing starting in probably September. Perfect. And Alex, how about yourself? Um, kind of same question to you. How has this program impacted your facility and the community in, down in Miami? So we're entering right now our seventh year of this program. Um, it's, I mean, with this program in place, is like we've experienced a budget changing increase all across the board. Um, pretty much in the six years that we've had and spearhead this program, we've, we've grossed $265,000 in direct enrollment, in card fee sales, and food and beverage. Um, this program has directly impacted that rolls right into our summer program, into our after school program. Every year we're increasing kids just getting into the game of golf. Um, we target this program for kids that have very little experience on the golf course. Uh, we don't do, this is not a program for elite players like some other facilities use them for. We have many elite players at our facilities that play world championships us kids or play on the south florida tour or and so forth ajga turn this season we like to utilize this program to get the kids at hand their first golf club and get them experience on the golf course awesome and and alex i know you run this program at multiple different facilities can you can you talk about kind of 
what impact, because I know you're in, you're at Crandon, you're at Meadow, all of these different facilities, what impact kind of across the board and being in so many facilities, can you just kind of speak to that? One of the most special things that we did uh, in 2018, um, sorry, 2019, I was approached by uh, Commissioner Oliver Gilbert from uh, Miami Gardens at the time, and that's the vice chair for Miami-Dade County, and he wanted to do a program in that area, country called Miami, for underserved youth. Um, so I got together with Lauren Court, and I got together with Rich Richardson in seeing how can we fully fund the program to uh, be able to provide golf uh, to kids that have never seen it before. So I was able to attain that first year. I did an eight-week program. Um, I had 88 juniors, um, schol full scholarships, and that spearheaded into Oliver Gilbert, the commissioner, fully funding a $160,000 yearly program that now we're in our third year to provide golf instruction at Miami-Dade County Parks in District 1 um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays throughout the whole year, provide them uh, winter break programs, provide them summer programs, spring break programs, and give all the kids and accessibility to country clients on Sundays and we provide them clinics. We are uh, now our third year of doing the uh, PGA Junior Golf League there, fully funded. Uh, this past year, we received close to 45. This whole, the total amount of program we received and fully funded was $45,000 in the last several years. Um, in down at Palmetto and King, it's just a no brain It's just been a lifeline to the facility. Um, it's just mainstream of getting kids involved, getting parents involved, we benefited from um, not only new golfers from the kids, but new golfers from, from adults. And it's just, we pretty much are the lifeline right now at the facility. Um, I tell you one thing, I mean, those that are trying to build on these programs, you know, you need, you need staff, you need support, and you need accessibility to the golf course. Um, I've been very fortunate enough to have that um, with Marty, Dan, Eric at all three facilities. And also the accessibility of the main and staff being able to open us up on the weekends and, and block off times. And I know it's difficult down here in South Florida during the season in order to do this. But, I mean, we benefit. I've, I've benefited greatly in seeing um, the growth of the game at all three facilities. Yeah, Alex, can you talk more about that, the course access piece of it? Um, I know, obviously, you come from a public facilities even harder to get course access and, and kind of how how do you spin that to uh, whether it's Marty or, or people at other golf courses, how do you spin why you need that course access and really make it beneficial to not just yourself, but to the facility as well? Well, so um, this year was a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a hardball because we are re we're currently redoing Palmetto. If there's only holes available at that facility right now. They did not, they, they redid, nine holes in the late fall before they carried over to the spring and then now they're redoing the other nine so um on tuesdays um, on tuesdays and wednesdays um dan was able to open up the golf course late in the afternoons block off times from four from 3 30 all the way down to dark uh, and give us access to that facility on at key biscayne marty on sun on saturdays or sundays depending this past year how the holidays were during the course of eight weeks, we're now in the sixth week of it. Um, he'll block off times for three o'clock, and that, that, that block is keeping extremely busy down there. It's a different animal, country club Miami. Um, country club Miami is right now, um, they postponed a renovation project that we've been working on for three years. Hopefully, it's going to happen now in 2024, off our fingers. But because of this, very, um, it's open. Not many, not many people are playing. It's it's so easy to facilitate the kids and bring them out there, take them on the golf. Course. Uh, I mean, that is just a joy to uh, be able to take the kids out there. Sometimes, if our facilities are uh, extremely busy, and Marty or Dan may need their facilities in order to um, to open up the times, we're able to bring all the kids, and bring the new country club of Miami as well as a springboard in order to get the kids on the golf course. Awesome. Yeah. And I know in talking 
um, PGA members at private facilities and, and public facilities too. That you know, during the summer months and at golf courses, when in the afternoons, it's it's really it's not busy, and, and giving the kids course access at that time is is really an easy ask of facilities. Bridget, I don't know if you have anything to add there about course access. Um, well, the course access in the summer. Let's interrupt you. I mean. We try and do the PGA Junior Golf Leagues in the spring because it springboards a lot of the kids potentially coming for a summer program. So we do it as a teacher. Um, in our summer program, we're so busy um, at all three facilities. So it's, uh, that's why I don't, I, I would not be able to do a, I mean, we'd be overwhelmed doing also a PGA Junior Golf League um, in the summer. I mean, I believe the participants last year, we had 200 and 260 kids in the spring that we're able to facilitate on the golf. Uh, but I do do a league in the fall, and that league that I do uh, utilize in the fall, last year was the first time I did it, and that was a country called Miami, a fully funded program. Again, uh, just because we have accessibility on the golf course, because it's um, it's undergoing renovations. It's going to undergo renovations, and, and not many people are playing it, so it's beneficial to get the kids on the golf course and it's easy access. Um, kind of in, in regards to course access, um, this is a hot topic. I'm on the, the Junior Player Development Committee for uh, National, and um, it's an issue all over the country, but I feel like it's more prevalent in South Florida. Uh, being a high school coach in Boca, I can't find a public or a private facility where my kids can go practice at. And I know I'm not the only school in the area that runs into the same issue. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what the answer is, but I know for junior golf in general, as professionals, I feel we need to do our job and push as much as we can to open up maybe three tea times in the <laughs> afternoon when it's especially slow right now to allow those juniors to come out. Um, cause if, if we're not making this game accessible and welcoming to the younger generation, how are we going to keep this game moving forward? Well, um, you know, at, at my three facilities, um, it, I mean, Ellingstock, we have, I've facilitated in the last seven years, over 70 tournaments, either us kids or even had a bridge with, I worked a lot with, um, gen law in order to provide us kids tournaments, either in the fall, summer and winter. Um, the head pros there that have gone through either Shane or Marty are huge junior golf supporters. So I haven't had that issue there. Um, I know that myself and the South Florida PGA could also verify in there uh, for the prep tour challenge tour and for the Meadows tour. I go out and paint the facilities. I help out at that facility in order to bring those tournaments in order for our kids to compete and play, whether it's in the, in the winter, fall, spring, summer, uh, Palmetto's done the same even they 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 open the doors for junior golf down there and even high school golf so we don't have an issue there um about i think last not this past winter the winter before um it was the first time a winter tour series for u.s kids golf was ever conducted in south florida down here in miami and i we did seven events over a country called miami back to back events I was able to facilitate that facility in order for kids to play in the winter and not have a gap from fall to spring. So um, I know I've done my part, and I know that our staff and our PGA pros at these three facilities have done their part in order to facilitate junior golf at these three places. Um, we constantly have kids. We open the doors with our junior rates. Are, um, I believe it's $10 for the kids to play with a junior patron card. Uh, we have five facilities they're able to access whether it's Palmetto, Country Club Miami, Key Biscayne, Reynolds Park, or Briar Bay. Um, I know now with, with Devin coming in, he's trying to bring youth on course to our facilities. I think that's going to happen. So I haven't had an issue on providing or accessibility with junior golf, whether it's our kids coming through our junior program. I mean, I know that we have one of the top, top in the country with all our kids that we facilitate, but well, the accessibility of other, other kids being able to participate at county golf courses down here hasn't been an issue yeah alex you do a great job advocating for junior golf especially in the miami area um sean in regards to youth on course um i think that's a great initiative i do know that they only cover the difference for the first year and then each facility 
after that needs to figure out how they're going to cover the remainder of the greens fee. So um, just want to put that out there. I think it's a great thing, but if, if the facility is not trying to figure out um, whether it's funding a tournament for junior golf or whatever, I think it becomes a little tricky situation after that. Um, I know I ran into that one time at a different facility. So just, just throwing that out there. On the note of course access, before we kind of move on from that topic, um, Bridget, do you want to talk about a little bit about what the park is doing? Obviously, it's a different concept um, within golf that we've seen down here, especially in Palm Beach County. But do you want to talk just a little bit more in detail about what the park's doing with open golf and supporting supporting junior golf specifically? Um, obviously, it's not something every facility can replicate, but it's certainly um, something we should talk more about. Sure, absolutely. Um, here at the park, we've only been open for uh, just over a month now. Um, but many of you know how big of an advocate I am for junior golf. So at the park right now, um, we we have a par three short course, and then we've got the regular 18 hole course. The short course um, with a paying adult, uh, which is twenty dollars to play the nine hole short course. Um, juniors are free when they're playing the regular golf course. Right now, the fee for juniors is 20% off of the Florida rate. Um, we're still trying to get our feet wet there, but I'm hoping to get a little more wiggle room with our junior rates here um, once we get more established. But I do know that moving forward, we're going to be um, open arms with section events um, for as well as with juniors. Um, we're, we're trying to dive into the community and especially help those that may be at risk or at need. Um, so right now we've, we're, we're tied into two different schools where we've got um, 48 kids total um, who've never played golf before and we're going to continue to do this and grow the game and welcome these kids and offer them an opportunity that they might have never had previously. If you, if you don't mind me asking, what is, what is the Florida rate for the juniors right now at the park? So we don't have set rates here. We work off a dynamic T sheet. Um, mm -hmm. Right now for Florida rate, it's $20 or $20. It's $120 for an adult to play. Um, for, before 12 it's walking only and then after that the the rates kind of fluctuate and and move down um so if you're if you're looking to play afternoon golf it's about 60 dollars and you know i think that's more reasonable to go play nine holes um but again we're we're trying to see what works for us i know i i kind of envision us being a destination um public facility um, if, if you haven't been out to the park yet, I would highly suggest coming out. It's completely different than what the golf course was before. Um, we have a lot to offer everyone, and, and I know the park is going to change lives moving forward. Awesome. I think Alex and Bridget, you both obviously are coming from public facilities, but whether it's public or private, how do you think you can use PGA Junior League to kind of leverage yourself to a facility and, and to show value both as yourself as a professional and um, show value of the program to your facility and whether it's your GM or director of golf to kind of keep it, um, keep it in the fold at the facility? Uh, personally, for me, I think pitching the idea of PGA Junior League is an easy sell. Um, why not open the doors, get as many kids involved in this game as you can, and it's a team sport. So that's pretty cool that you're you're getting, you know, anybody under 13 to go out and pair some kids up that probably would have never played golf together and let's have them play a scramble. So. I mean, I agree with it's just it's a no-brainer um it I mean like i mentioned earlier before the statistics of what we've made um it's also a bond of what we've had with the parents and the kids i mean the kids really enjoy it um you know 
seeing the aspect of, of the competitiveness that you're seeing of the kids that are playing U.S. kids events or prep tour events. Uh, the team sport aspect is, um, I mean, it's just it's just great. I mean, but well, I'm, before you need you need support, you need support of your of the club in order to be able to facilitate and be able to on the golf. And the, if you have that, this program and it could be a win. That's why we're on our seventh year. Because whether I've had, you know, we've had different pros at different facilities, they all they all buy in and they help out. So it's just they see the longevity of the program. They see that um, we're growing the game to the best of our ability. Um, and, I mean, it's, it's just no brainer. Alex, um, since you have had such such success in this space, um, doing the program for seven years, um, talk about a little bit the, the first year or two and what that looked like for you. I think a lot of times um, that kind of seems to be where facilities hit, you know, what they see as a dead end road when they're trying to get the, the program up and running and they try it for a year or two and it's it's not doing all these things that we're talking about. So what did that first year or two look like for you and and how did you overcome those hurdles to now be in your seventh year? So I didn't have much hurdles. Uh, the support I had from from Lauren and from, you know, her, I bought into the program. And I think our first year we had at Crandon 56 kids and at Palm Met 60, something, something like that. Year. So it just, uh, it just, it just grew. I mean, I had accessibility to the golf course. So it never, I never had a hurdle because we ha we have a huge junior program. I mean, we, um, we, we, the only hurdle that I had was at the end of the first year of the junior program, when we had an all-star team that went to Port St. Lucie. Um, this is a program that I feel strong program that basically building kids, beginners or very little intermediate players to participate in this program and when we went to Fort St. Lucie with an all-star team um the kids that were playing there were all-star players and it wasn't it um a lot of our kids had demoralized I'm sure the I mean, Lauren knows about it um they played this competitive all, all these kids that were playing were kids that were winning on U.S. kids events kids were playing at U.S. kids worlds or and that wasn't that's not the premise of this program our premise of this program is to build from scratch these kids club in their hand and enjoy it and i've gone through that for seven years i'm not i could i could simply put an elite program right now and could compete at the national car rental center every year it doesn't but that's not what i'm buying into this program i bought in to put a kids club in their hand at first and grow the game right from scratch and that's what that's what we've done that's why we've been very successful with these kids and the parents have bought in and the, the, the brothers and sisters and siblings have gone through it so it's just been a a great feature. So I really didn't jump into any hurdles. Um, I've, as, as a junior golf chair, I've put out there times all our statistics and put out information in order for PGA apprentices and PGA members to reach out to us for consulting and to ask us any questions on how we do the program. And needless to say, I haven't had many who reach out at all to really see what this program really does. And it impacts it impacts the facility greatly, not only with less in revenue, not only with food and beverage revenue, and not only with off course revenue. You know, so I really there wasn't a lot of hurdles, but because I've I've had I've been very fortunate enough to have great staff, great support in our maintenance, and and I mean everyone's been very helpful. You know, Alex, Alex I think. Uh, well, go sorry. ahead, Bridget. Um, I think your philosophy on what. PGA Junior League is is 100% spot on because some of these facilities try to jam pack their their teams with the best players, but that's that's not really what it's about. Um, if you have some really good players, I would always pair them up with a more of a beginner because to me that's the best way you learn the sport. Um, Alex, you are definitely in a unique situation though too since you have your programs funded. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I think that's a great idea to have other facilities reach out to you and and figure out how they can do that with with either if you're in a private club within your membership or you know within the community that you're in. You know, I saw last year. Um, you know, we have kids in our elite program that compete. You know, we have what thirty some kids that make it to worlds every year. U.S. kids or compete South Florida and AJGA and Under Armour and 
we're, we're sitting back and watching NTV and we're seeing not to name names. We're seeing about six or eight of our kids that participate in our programs and there are other facilities participating at PGA Junior Golf League, but we know they never did. They just strapped on a shirt, strapped on a NPC, and were able to compete for that facility. And that's not what we're tar- That's not what I target as a PGA Junior Golf League. So, uh, I mean, maybe the premise of other facilities is to get them to a national level and win. But I mean, I'm winning, putting putting clubs in first hand in kids' faces and seeing them really happy playing with other other teammates and stuff. And that's that's your win in itself. I don't need an accolade of, of making sure my kid makes it all the way to a national level when it's just that that's not our plan. That's not our premise when I took over this program. And that's why we're successful. Alex, you talked earlier about obviously your program is now self-funded, but you talked earlier about going through the scholarship program. Can you talk more about that and, and talk about the the financial impact that you still received through that scholarship program? Sure. So I, I I never knew that we could get scholarships for the PGA Junior Golf League until I um I born and she briefed me on it and then I reached out to um, Rich Richardson, which is the PGA National Account Executive, and I told him what I what I wanted to do with these kids. Uh, they couldn't afford to pay for a PGA Junior Golf League. Um, I uh, so what it is is I I uh, I, made it, I got the list of the of the participants. Uh, Rich went ahead and. Gave me codes for the parents to come up, come on board, go online, um, use the code as a full scholarship um, because in financial need. And by doing that, we also receive a portion of that uh, small supplemental income in order for teaching uh, for us uh, to be able to do the program. Even though um, it's not funding exactly the total amount of programs, we spend a lot on different things. But um, and from there, I just. I just started building. I had 88 kids, and the program was a complete success. So from that, um, I said, you know what? This is great. Let's do this next year. Um, I asked again. Uh, if, if scholarships were, were going to be available, she said scholarships are all available. Uh, and then uh, the feedback that I that I got from Rich, I, I always took pictures. I, I gave him I gave him a lot of our feedback of the parents, of how gracious they are that their kids are. On off course and experiencing a game that they've never thought that they would ever play, and um, we continued onward. It's just it was easy. I just asked, um, and I was able to facilitate. And I just do that every year. But the kids that we do do in the program right now that uh, we recently had is um, kids that were uh, that we teach golf from District One. So basically, kids that we've seen from this program that Miami Day Parks and Recreation full that we we see on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays that come to our facility. And um, we try to keep different kids coming to the program, not the same kid, because we want to give exposure to different kids. So we let new kids filter in, and then if there's spots available, then we'll allow those other kids that have participated before jump in. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and I know um, the national office is working to increase that number, um, that financial impact on the PGA professional per player. So um, that when they do have those um, scholarship kids come through, they still are, are receiving just as much money as they would if a kid isn't scholarshiped um, so that our PGA members can continue to um, be kind of self-sufficient and, and make an income off of this program. Is there anything else on junior golf that um, Ellen, Bridget, Alex, that you'd like to touch on uh, before we kind of shift gears to PGA Hope? On junior golf or PGA Junior Golf? Uh, either. So I, um, my my question I have is, is the uh, I know the Honda Classic sponsors no, uh, they're not resigning. Is there going to be an event next year for the, uh, the PGA Tour coming either Broward County or West Palm Beach? Sorry, what was the question? Okay. Um, here's where I got is over the years, I've seen a lot of juniors in South Florida, uh, whether it's girls or boys. Some of the top juniors in the country we have are going to prestigious universities, either, either ASU, Stanford, um, University of Central Florida, Florida. And we never recognize these kids at PJ Tour events or LPJ Tour. We never get a sponsor's exemption for them. And in my last report, I want to count. PGA and our board in order to, if, if when I was a kid growing up and when I was a, uh, playing college, 
the top ranked amateur junior was able to play as a sponsored example the PGA Tour event, the PGA Tour event. And those kids, those kids always made the cut. They got an opportunity to play with the pros. We've never done that. We've never done that down here in South Florida. We haven't let one of our top amateurs or top juniors play in these events. I think, you know, we should give some sort of recognition to some of the top juniors that go through our programs, that go to South Florida Junior Golf Tour, that play competitively, that represent Florida. At any at one of our events, if they come back, I I think they need to get an opportunity, but well earned for their for their junior golf accolades. Um, I haven't seen that in a long time. I was a kid. We had Floyd brothers got to compete, play throughout the round the opens. They both uh, we had James Martin, we had Eric Compton, a fellow teammate when in high school, Chris Kerr, playing LPGA event. All made the cut. All showed that they were just in play with pros. I think we need we need to get back to that eventual full board if a turn down in South Florida. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's that's a, a great idea, a great um, it's it's definitely something we can talk about internally, obviously with the the Honda in our back door, um, and and them as a as a partner of ours. Um, it's something that we can discuss moving forward for sure. Are you ready to shift gears to PJ Hope? Yeah. Okay. Um, Bridget, we'll look more towards you. Um, you know, for this category, as I know you've you've um, ran successful PJ Hope programs, and will continue to do so. But um, what can you just start with explaining how a program is conducted, how you got involved, and and ultimately what's expected of a facility? Sure. Um, so I initially went through the training in 2018, and um, just re went through the training again when we hosted it at the beginning of may um i think i've gone through seven or eight six-week programs right now um the way that i run my my pga hope classes is if there are three instructors um we're, we're hitting putting chipping full swing every single week uh, what I like to do is if, say I'm on full swing. Uh, I prefer to keep the same pro on that station for two weeks and then rotate them um, because everybody has a different teaching style. Um, I like to do a lot of game-based learning like I would with juniors uh, and especially with vets. They're, they're competitive as hell. So the more that you can make it fun out there, um, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, with this specific program, um, this is my favorite program to run. Uh, it has been the most impactful program I run. Um, man, I'm getting a little emotional about this right now. Mm -hmm. um, but the PGA Hope in general is a golf therapy program with golf sprinkled in it. Um, whew. uh, yesterday I had a, uh, woman stop into, uh, the shop and she's a vet. She wants to take lessons. Um, she has a lot of PTSD. So she sat in her car for 30 minutes, studied the website, saw me on there, saw me walking into the shop and then encouraged her. We did a lesson right then and there, and um, she started crying afterwards because we just, ooh, um, we started talking about this program and uh, what something like this means to our vets. I'll give you a break because I know. Um that's I saw that story that you posted on your Instagram and that's that's really, really special. And I think that Ellen and I both can speak a little bit to um, how meaningful the program is. I mean, we were out at the Hope Classic last week, um, which is a big fundraising event for this program specifically. Um, and it's pretty amazing. We had, you know, a couple of veterans out there. They play a hole with with the participants. And then at the end of the night, they they at least one of them has an opportunity to, to grab the microphone and explain you know her testimony um going through the program and i've heard her 
say these words over and over throughout my years with this section, but it never gets old because it, it really is um, powerful what the game of golf can do to, to the lives of our veterans and, and lives in general. And I, I think um, when we talk about growing the game, you know, our, our minds typically go right to junior golf. And, and obviously that's incredibly important. We spent the first 30 minutes of the session talking about junior golf, but um, there's other communities in which we can touch. And, and I think veterans is, a, is obviously a huge, um, huge community that, that needs this game. And um, this program is, is so powerful and, and it takes, you know, not a lot of your time, right, Bridget? I mean, it's obviously yeah. there's, there's the uh, um, instructor training that, that you must go through before you can be an instructor. And that's just to go through um, expectations of, of how you speak and, and handle some of, some of these situations. Because there are a lot of unique situations you see with veterans, especially ones who maybe have been wounded or, or, or are in wheelchairs now or suffer, like you said, from PTSD. Um, so that's what the instruct the um, HOPE instructor training kind of covers. But the, at the end of the day, you're still going out there and doing what you guys do best, which is which is give golf lessons and 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 grow the game of golf in that way. So, um, you know, I guess talk a little bit about the logistics of a PJ HOPE program. Um, and ways in which your facility can help impact it beyond just the six-week program. Sure. Um, I know uh, Bo Preston at the Links of Boynton, he runs a, a, a great league, a weekly league right now. Um, here at the park, we're going to start regular programming in the fall. Um, in the past, uh, up in Michigan this past summer, I had a weekly clinic um, uh, I charged $20 for it, um, and, and tapped into the local veterans, um, either the Legion post or, you know, whatever organization to start building this program. And I didn't, I didn't keep any money from it. I put it back into food and beverage. And afterwards we all hung out coffee, bagels and made it more of a, a fun atmosphere, um, for, for the facility that is running um, the program, I I definitely encourage you you all to go through this the training and have your facility become active with PGA Hope um, if you can. Um, while you're running your six week program, uh, a couple things are asked of the the facility. Having a tent out there at all the stations is critical, along with chairs because a lot of these veterans, they won't tell you if they have physical limitations and they're used to just beating themselves to death. Um, they've seen things that we can't even imagine. So I always find it, that I'm, I'm telling these vets, it is okay to sit down and take a break. Uh, it's not out here, this is not rapid fire. Uh, we're gonna have some fun, but I need you to come back next week. And that's another thing as an instructor, um, Heather Angel's on this. We've had a couple discussions regarding both programs. Um, as an instructor running various different programs, um, one thing that you do is you're, you have a lot of accountability on those that are coming to your class. But with this program specifically, you don't know what these guys are going through, these guys and girls are going through. So they might show up the first week and they might not even talk to anybody, but they're there and that's half their battle throughout the day. And then um, they might show up three weeks down the road. So if you have one person at your class or all 20 every single week, you know, that's something you can't really put too much care into. The fact that they're out there enjoying themselves hopefully not having um any any flashes of of what they've been through during that time on the golf course um i've seen a few situations where um this woman specifically did not speak to anybody for the first four weeks and then she finally started opening up she was hitting golf balls on the range and she just stopped hitting and was staring and i'm like what is everything okay like what's going on and she's like I've never heard anything so peaceful. It's like it's a cool situation. That's awesome. 
And what, Bridget, I mean, in your opinion, um, what does it look like to sustain um, these these people who are getting involved with golf beyond those six weeks? I mean, obviously, PGA Hope is a huge focus of what we do at the section, um, but, but ways we're looking in the future to continue growing the game in this way is how do we sustain these people in the game beyond it? One, I mean, most importantly for their overall health and well-being, but two, um, to keep those people playing the game of golf. Yeah, I think um, the section still, we're, we're all still trying to figure out yeah. how to engage the vets moving forward. I know here we, we're offering a 20% um, discount on greens fees. I'm personally offering a 20% discount on, on lesson rates. Um, we, need to, we need to make it more welcoming um, it's just like the situation I had yesterday. How do you create a welcoming environment for that new beginner? But more importantly, for the veteran who has could potentially have some issues and doesn't know where things are, that that's a huge hurdle for them to to jump over. Um, I think the leagues are a great start, but I, I think more facilities need to start welcoming the veterans specifically, whether it's a play day once a month, maybe. Um, I think the tournament that the section hosts in September or where the veterans are playing with some of the, the professionals, I think that's awesome. Um, yep, uh, Sean, I see you guys do a lot with First Tee. Um, I know that's that's not specifically a hope program, but that's that's another great thing you can do as a clinic on a, on a weekly or annual basis for veterans. Awesome. Um, anything you'd like to add on PJ Hope? I mean, I, I think as Jackie was saying earlier, I think the biggest thing that I've gotten out of PJ Hope and, and seen through it is these veterans have given the ultimate sacrifice in, in serving their country. And if we can do something as small as teach them the game of golf, it, it's, it seems like such a small thing on our end to, you know, teach them how to swing and, and putt and all of that. But to them, it's, it can be life-changing and, and we've, we've seen it um, on our end and, and Bridget, I know you have as well. Um, that something so small can mean so much to somebody. Um, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think when when and if you go through the the training program, um, I think that's a little intense because it kind of goes to the extreme situations where you might have somebody with limb loss, and um, a lot of the vets that I've seen, it's it's a lot of PTSD issues. Um, you have to remember, there's still regular people at the end of the day. They've gone through some shit, but. They're here to play golf. They want they want to thank you for being there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Um I, I I guess at this point, um, unless Bridget or Alex, you have anything more to add on on some of these particular programs, um, would love to to open it up a little bit if there's questions or comments um, or other ideas that people have that would like to share with the overall group. Um, now's the time to do so. Jackie, I'll throw something out. Um, yep. I just had my first uh, PGA Hope session on Sunday and it was amazing. I mean, it was, they were all fantastic. It was really cool to get out there and meet them, work with them a little bit. We're looking forward to the rest of the five weeks of the program and really, um, really a neat experience. They were also appreciative of us being out there and um, just a really, a really neat experience. Heather. Yeah, go ahead, Bridget. I think with PJ Hope, um, the funny thing is you're very appreciative of what they've done for our country, but they flip it on you. And <laughs> that is so weird mm -hmm. for them to be so grateful for that, for being at the golf course and, and learning something new. Yeah. 
Oh, I know I had some that were like, what can we work on between now and next week? And I'm just like, come out here and practice. You know, the facility that we're at is a public facility. So they can come out and use the putting green and chipping green for free and the golf balls. I'm sure they would um, offer them some sort of discount and uh, so they can get out there and get practicing and work on the skills that they learned the week prior. Awesome. Heather, I'm going to shoot just uh, use you as an example um, since you were brave enough to, to speak up. But since that was your first uh, program, I'm just wondering um, for, for those on the call, maybe that haven't gotten started with PGA Hope for one reason or the other. Can you just talk through some of the hurdles that maybe you face personally and, and you know, taking, I guess, the risk, if you will, to, to coach a new group of people? or just with the facility and getting the, the facility to accept the program there? Sure. Yeah, sure. The facility is not my facility. Um, the particular facility, I think, volunteered, and they were super excited to host them. I think it's great that it's at a public facility so that they have access to it in between and after the program is over with. Um, as far as the hurdles, Bridget and I have talked several times about it. Just I think it was more – it wasn't the instruction portion. I, I didn't – Thus far, we have we don't have anyone with any major physical limitations that we know of at this point. Um, but so the, the instruction portion wasn't the issue. I think for me, and, and like I said, Bridget, and I've talked about this several times, just, you know, making sure that they have a good time, kind of almost like issues from your own end, thinking that, you know, it's they they're going to struggle, they're going to, the, but they're just, they're people and they just want to play golf and they just want to get better. And it's it's it was a really a really fun experience. I'm looking forward to working with them further. And um, I don't think there was any really major major limitations. Once you get go through the certified training, I I did mine with um, Judy Alvarez, and she was fantastic. She's she's been in the with the veterans for years and years teaching them. So she had a lot of knowledge on that. So um, I think it was just uh, you know going through the process of the training. And then being able to uh, just kind of make sure you have everything. That was kind of what I was wondering. Like, do I have water? Do I have shade? Do I have chairs? Do I have, you know, since it wasn't at my facility, I wanted to make sure I had covered all my bases by the time I got there. Knowing at my facility, I could just run in and grab whatever I needed. It was making sure that I was prepared there. And um, I have two other instructors that are helping me with it. So it's, and, and Brianna comes to the first one with uh, to be there with you and kind of make sure everything's, working well. So um, it's been a great experience so far. Good. Awesome. Good. Happy to hear that. Um, I think it's it's interesting um, when when you run PJ Hope at a public facility, because I think to one of Bridget's earlier points, one of the big, um, I guess, hurdles that, that we face in, in keeping these people sustained in the game is just that welcoming aspect. And so if you have it at a public facility, it's nice because they can they come for their program and they see, hey, this isn't this isn't that hard, you know, or, or that big of a deal that you may build it up in your mind to to step foot on on a golf course for the first time for many of these people. Um, so seeing that community and the fact that they're welcome to come back at any point, I think is is a benefit, obviously, to the public space. But we've seen a lot of successful programs at private courses as well. So. Um, you can do them, obviously, at, at both areas, um, or I'm sorry, both both types of facilities, um, and we've seen success in both ways. Um, is there anything else out there that, that people would like to comment on or, or ask questions um, of, of Bridget or Alex or, or Ellen or, or the rest of the group on the call? Um, please feel free. Otherwise, um, I'll share the contact information for Alex and Bridget uh, following the call, and, and you're welcome to to hound them with questions. I'm sure they'll they'll love that. But um, you know, we're all here with one mission, and that's obviously to grow the game of golf. So, um, anytime you need anything from us at the section, Ellen specifically in the junior golf space, Brianna or Brianna, excuse me, um, in the Hope and Foundation space, um, we're here to help. So let us know how we can do that and, and continue to, to push the game forward. I'll just say thank you, Bridget and Alex. Really appreciate um, your time and perspective on these topics. Um, and hopefully John's doing okay this morning with his <laughs> that came up. But 
Um, thank you both of you for, for being a part of the call and, and sharing with us. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yep. Awesome. Well, everybody have a great day, a great week, and um, hopefully some, some exciting and fun things on the golf course this week ahead. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Bye.